In March of 2006, NVIDIA released the GeForce 7900 GTX as a response to ATI's Radeon X1900 XTX, which kicked off one of the most legendary GPU battles of the mid-2000s. In this video, we're going to be revisiting this decade and a half old deathmatch as these cards go mano a mano in a variety of older and semi-modern titles, and we'll also be measuring power draw. This is going to be a long one, so get your favorite beverage, maybe a snack as well, and enjoy the video. First, we'll get into the specs of the cards, and to start, we have the Radeon. It comes equipped with the R580 GPU, which sports a very impressive 48 pixel shaders, along with 8 vertex shaders, 16 TMUs, 16 ROPs, and a core clock of 650 MHz. VRAM wise, we have 512 megs of GDDR3 running at 775 MHz, which is on a 256 bit bus, resulting in a total memory bandwidth of 50 GB per second. Now this card is kind of a pig when it comes to power consumption, with a TDP of 135 watts. Next up we've got Nvidia's mean green fighting machine, the 7900 GTX. It's rocking the G71 GPU which has 24 pixel shaders, 8 vertex shaders, 24 TMUs, 16 ROPs, and is clocked at 650 MHz. For memory we've also got 512MB of GDDR3 clocked at 800 MHz, and it's running on a 256-bit bus for a total memory bandwidth of 51 gigabytes per second, very similar to the X1900 XTX. The TDP comes in at 84 watts, so this thing should be nowhere near as thirsty as its red rifle, which is something we'll be putting to the test later. Before we get into some benchmarks, let's talk about how these cards came to be, and it all starts with the release of the original GeForce 7800 GTX in June of 2005. It was a very impressive part for the time, building on the success of Nvidia's Curry microarchitecture by adding a lot more power under the hood. Four months later in October of 2005, ATI released their late but definitely not unimpressive competitor, the Radeon X1800 XT. It was the first ATI card to boast their new R500 architecture, and with it brought Shader Model 3.0 support and a large performance uplift over its predecessor, which was also enough to overtake the 7800 GTX and crown ATI's flagship, the new King. A month later, Nvidia was right back into the game with their 512MB variant of the 7800 GTX, which brought more memory to the table and 16% higher core clocks over the OG version thanks to using a binned G70 GPU. Shortly afterwards, in January of the new year, ATI would release their very powerful Radeon X1900 XTX, which came equipped with the mighty R580 GPU. It used the R500 architecture same as the X1800 XT, but ATI scaled up their pixel shader engine by tripling the amount of pixel shader cores, which gave the card monster pixel shading performance for the time. Oh, and we've got some higher clock speeds too. Needless to say, it quickly dethroned the 7800 GTX 512, so once again it was back to the drawing board for Nvidia. And only two months later, they came out swinging with the 7900 GTX. Now the card didn't feature a new architecture or even a change in base specs, but rather a die shrink from 110 nanometers to 90. This allowed Nvidia to pack the same amount of power as the original G70 in a die only about 59% of the size. It also came with a big 30% core clock advantage over the 7800 GTX 512, and as a result the 7900 GTX competed very well against ATI's X1900 XTX in games of the time. So we know how these cards did back in 2006, but how do they stack up in more modern scenarios? Do these cards have what it takes to handle what the future would hold? To thoroughly test the performance, I selected 9 games with release dates ranging from 2004 to 2013, so we're definitely covering a lot of ground here. For the test system, I used my former main rig, and it's got a 3770K overclocked to 4.4GHz along with 16GB of DDR3 RAM. Certainly overkill for the cards we'll be pairing with it. If you're interested in some more detailed specs as well as the drivers used for testing, they're on screen. Also, all of today's testing was done in Windows 7 64-bit. Without any further ado, let's see how these 16-year-old flagships hold up in this graphics card one-on-one. -on -one. Starting off with the older titles, we have Fear, and I used the built-in benchmark with 1080p and all settings maxed out with 4x FSAA and 16x AF. The X1900 XTX was leading here with 47 frames per second on average, which was 9% faster than the 7900 GTX. Frame times didn't look great on either card, which is normal for the built-in benchmark. All in all, this was a pretty close battle between the two. Next game is Splinter Cell Chaos Theory, and I used Hardware OC's standalone benchmarking tool with the 1280x1024 resolution and Shader Model 3.0 with no AA and HDR set to enabled. 
The X1900 XTX was ahead once again with an average frame rate of 81 frames per second, with the 7900 GTX hot on its heels at 72. Frame times were pretty good on both cards, although I will say that the 7900 GTX exhibited slightly more disruptive stutter. Overall, this game was a great showing for both cards tested. Half-Life 2 is up next, and I benched a section of the Water Hazard chapter of the game with 1080p and the high settings with no AA and no HDR. The X1900 XTX averaged 99 frames per second, edging out the 7900 GTX by 19%. Averages were still great on the 7900 GTX, but frame times were a bit worse compared to its competition. The game was a good showing on the X1900 XTX, but performance on the 7900 GTX left a lot to be desired. Next up we have the original Witcher, and I benched the beginning cutscene from when it faded in to right before Geralt first grabs his sword. I chose some pretty modest settings here with 720p in the medium preset. Taking a look at the charts, the 7900 GTX actually took the lead in this title, being 13% ahead the Radeon. Frame times looked pretty bad on both cards as the run was plagued with many spikes above 100 milliseconds, but this is normal in the opening cutscene and is not felt in regular gameplay. Next up is Stalker Call of Pripyat, and I used the standalone benchmarking tool in 720p with the medium preset and full dynamic lighting. The X1900 XTX did pretty well in this game, averaging 57 frames per second with some decent 1 and 0.1% lows to boot. Average frame rates were good on the 7900 GTX, but I can't say the same for the frame times unfortunately. The Radeon beat out its rival pretty badly in this title, but trust me, you haven't seen anything yet. The newest game in the suite is next, Tomb Raider. I used the built-in benchmark with 720p in the low preset with no AA. The X1900 XTX did decently here, returning very playable frame rates. As for the 7900 GTX, its averages are 35% slower than the X1900 XTX, and its frame times weren't great as well. Definitely not the best showing for the GeForce. Next game up is the iconic system killer from 2007, Crisis. I used the built-in benchmark with a 720p resolution in the medium preset. Looking at the charts, frame rates looked decent on the X1900 XTX, but its frame times were terrible with awful swings throughout all of the benchmark. Now, the 7900 GTX's frame times were far more consistent, but on average it was just a lot slower than the XTX. It's kind of hard to say which card won here, as they both dished out some pretty poor results. Far Cry 2 is next, and I used the built-in benchmark with 1080p and the medium preset. The X1900 XTX did very well in this title, flexing its pixel shading muscle, but as for the 7900 GTX, well, it performed horribly here, with lots of stutter throughout the benchmark resulting in some mediocre averages and awful frame times. In addition, there was a large stutter over 200 milliseconds at the beginning of the benchmark, and this was repeatable in multiple runs. Later in the video, we'll get into why the 7900 GTX's performance is suffering so much in the newer titles. Our last game for today is Mountain Blade Warband, and I benched a small custom battle using 1080p with the high settings and no AA. The 7900 GTX held its own in this title, offering performance close to the X1900 XTX, but the Radeon still pulled ahead by 15%. Frame times looked great on both cards, and overall it was refreshing to see a close battle between the two again. Alright, so averaging all the games tested, we can see the X1900 XTX rounds off at a nice 60 FPS for average frame rates, with the 7900 GTX pulling off 48. That's a 25% lead for the X1900 XTX on terms of averages, and it took home around a 30% win on 1 and 0.1% lows. Now I'm guessing that these results are pretty surprising to most of you given how closely these cards performed back in the day, but soon we'll talk about why the 7900 GTX crumbled in those newer games. I decided to include a synthetic test from the era, and we've got 3D Mark 06, and I just used the default settings. The X1900 XTX is leading by 10% in the total score, with Shader Model 2.0 scores very similar between the two cards. As for Shader Model 3.0 scores though, the X1900 XTX was ahead here by 17%. All in all, these are some pretty interesting results put down by the cards. And finally, we have Power Draw. I loaded up Tomb Raider's built-in benchmark on both cards and measured total system power consumption. 
Keep in mind these numbers were taken directly from the wall and don't factor in PSU efficiency. Now we can see the 7900 GTX isn't too thirsty with the system drawing 192 watts of power. As to be expected, the X1900 XTX loves the juice and that number went up to 233 watts of power. Even though the X1900 XTX consumes 21% more power, I was kind of expecting the gap in power consumption to be wider. So, at this point you probably have one big question on your mind. Why is the performance of Nvidia's 7000 series so disappointing in later games? Well, there's actually a couple of reasons for this, but one of the main ones is that the pixel shading performance on G71 and G70 wasn't very strong. As shader codes started to get more complicated over time, conditional branches were becoming utilized more often. G71 and G70 were very ill-equipped for this as they had a huge thread size of 1024 pixels which didn't give them the granularity required to run shader code with a lot of conditional branches effectively. This meant that one missed branch would result in many cycles wasted on flushing the pixel pipeline. Now, R580 on the other hand had a thread size of only 48 pixels, which allowed the GPU to perform branches, loops, and subroutines very efficiently. Not only that, R520 and R580 contained a very forward-looking piece of hardware, the ultra-threading dispatch processor. This was essentially dedicated scheduling hardware that would do things like accelerate dynamic flow control with Shader Model 3.0, prevent stalls and wasted ALU cycles, and hide texture fetch latency as well. To top it off, R580 has the edge in raw pixel shading power thanks to ATI tripling the amount of quad pixel shader cores over R520. All of this essentially made R580 ideally equipped for what the future would hold. It's not all doom and gloom for the 7900 GTX though. Not only does it consume less power than the X1900 XTX, it runs much cooler as well. The X1900 XTX came with a loud blower cooler from the factory, and it was known to commonly hit over 90 degrees Celsius with it. In fact, even with the aftermarket Salmon cooler on my card, it still runs above 80 degrees under full load, which is pretty crazy. The 7900 GTX on the other hand comes with a big 4 heat pipe heatsink with a large quiet fan in the middle, resulting in the card being virtually silent and staying below 70 degrees under full load while doing it. Certainly much better than the X1900 XTX on that front. Overall, it's surprising to see how two once very closely performing GPUs are in totally different leagues when it comes to later and more complex games. I really enjoyed testing these cards and creating this video, and I'd like to see how their successors, the Radeon HD 2900 XT and GeForce 8800 GTX hold up against each other as well, if I can get a hold of them. For now though, that'll be the end of this video. Thank you all so much for watching, like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one.